The Pyrrhic War, spanning from 280 to 275 BC, was a pivotal conflict between the burgeoning Roman Republic and Pyrrhus, the formidable king of Epirus. Initiated by a plea for aid from the Greek city Tarentum in southern Italy, Pyrrhus brought his skilled army, including war elephants, to challenge Roman dominance in the region. Despite initial successes against the Roman legions, Pyrrhus incurred heavy losses and faced dwindling support from allies. Plutarch's famous account of Pyrrhus lamenting one more victory like this and we are lost gave rise to the term Pyrrhic victory. Worn down by relentless warfare, Pyrrhus eventually turned his attention to Sicily, leaving the Romans to consolidate their strength. Returning to Italy in 275, Pyrrhus faced another battle. How did it turn out? Well, you're about to find out. Hello everyone, I'm the ASMR historian welcoming you to another extensive long video. It's going to be great. If you'd like to support the channel, how about you go check out the Patreon? It's a good way to avoid those YouTube ads. And you'll have my eternal gratitude. Short of that, help me out in the algorithm with a like and subscribe. Well, without further ado, let's get busy with our topic for today, the Pyrrhic War. In 290 BC, following the conclusion of the Three Samnite Wars, Rome had solidified its dominance over parts of central and southern Italy. Forming alliances with various Italic tribes in the region. South of Rome's influence lay the Greek city-states of Magna Graecia and Tarentum, emerging as the largest and most formidable among them. The outbreak of hostilities between Rome and Tarentum was triggered by differing accounts from historians such as Apion, Cassius Dio, and Zonaris. Now, according to Apion, in 282 BC, ten Roman ships ventured close to Tarentum's coast, led by Publius Cornelius Dolabella, who was allegedly simply sightseeing along the coast of Magna Graecia. Sightseeing. Right. Exploiting an old treaty barring Roman ships from sailing beyond Lacinium, promontory near Croton, a demagogue incited the locals to attack, resulting in the sinking of four ships and the capture of one with all of its crew. However, Cassius Dio and Zonaris provided alternative narratives, omitting any mention of treaties between Rome and Tarentum. Zonaris suggested that the Tarentines associated with Romans adversaries, including the Etruscans, the Gauls, and the Samnites, leading to suspicions and subsequent hostilities when Lucius Valerius, described as the Admiral, attempted to anchor off Tarentum's coast. The Tarentines, perceiving this as retaliation for their past actions, responded by sinking Roman ships and capturing the crew. In Cassius Dio's account, Lucius Valerius was dispatched on an errand, 
while the Tarentines were inebriated during the Dionysiac festival, which was basically a festival where everybody got drunk. Apparently this rather pleased the god Dionysus. Upon sighting Valerius's ships, well, they suspected hostile intentions, and they immediately attacked without asking any questions. One can only imagine that they may have perhaps been in an alcohol-fueled rage and thought, yeah, let's make this a party to remember by kicking in some Roman heads. The Romans, though angered by this act, initially refrained from immediate retaliation against Tarentum. Instead, they sent envoys to address the situation peacefully and diplomatically, seeking to avoid appearing passive and thus encouraging further Tarentine aggression. However, the Tarentines rebuffed the envoys and insulted them. Well, this was the last straw for Rome, and they declared war. Well, that was Cassius Dio's account, at least. Or at least one of them. There is another narrative by Cassius Dio, and it goes like this. The Romans became aware of Tarentum's preparation for war, and dispatched Gaius Fabricius Lucinus as an envoy to allied cities, aiming to prevent a rebellion. However, these efforts were thwarted when the allied cities arrested Fabricius and aligned themselves with Rome's adversaries leading to succession. Cassius Dio suggests that the Tarentines initiated hostilities, but felt rather secure in doing so, due to their belief that Rome was unaware of their plans, citing Rome's temporary embarrassments. Well, spoiler alert, Rome was very aware of what Tarentum was doing. This ambiguity arises from the fact that Rome sent envoys shortly after the ship attacks, followed by a declaration of war upon their insult. Little did the Tarentines know, Rome was just trying to act diplomatically. Trying to show a little bit of manners even after their ships were sunk and the crews turned into slaves. Sorry about that. Thus, it was unclear what pretense Tarentum perceived. Additionally, the mention of Gaius Fabricius's mission coinciding with the ship attack suggests a timeline where the events may have influenced each other. All of this just further complicates the narrative. This period also saw a rebellion among various Italic peoples, potentially fueled by the tensions between Rome and Tarentum. According to Apian, the Tarentines accused the Greek city of Thury of siding with the Romans instead of fellow Greeks leading to an attack on the Thury. Expulsion of its noble citizens and dismissal of the Roman garrison stationed there. Now that ought to annoy the Senate, wouldn't it? Livy's Perioche noted Roman support for the Thury during conflicts with the Lucani around 286, honouring the plebeian tribune Gaius Aelius, with a statue in the Roman Forum for his proposal to aid Thury. Dionysius of Halicarnassus credited Gaius Fabricius Lucinus 
serving as consul in 282 BC, with breaking sieges and defeating various Italian peoples, including those surrounding Thury. What about modern historians? Well, as for them, they suggest that the breach of the Thury Treaty and the siege's lifting prompted the attack on the Roman ships. This discredits Apian's notion of sightseeing. Tarentum feared Rome's expanding influence after Thury sought Roman protection around 286. Apian attributed Tarentum's blame for the treaty in Thury for violations as a pretext for aggression, possibly referencing treaties with Alexander of Epirus or Cleonymus of Sparta. The Romans demanded restitution from Tarentum after the ship attack, but the envoys didn't get much luck with that. They never really got their restitution. Well, at least not in the original form, they asked. Well, upon their return to Rome, there was widespread indignation, with some advocating for subduing rebellious Italian peoples before confronting Tarentum. However, the proponents of immediate war prevailed. Lucius Aemilius Barbola, a consul in 281 BC, was tasked with offering peace terms to Tarentum before resorting to war, as per Apian's account. Alternatively, Zunarus suggested that Lucius Aemilius offered peace proposals, hoping for Tarentum's acceptance, but faced internal divisions. Tarentine envoys sought an alliance with Pyrrhus, prompting Lucius Aemilius to raid their lands. Despite efforts to reconcile, disagreements persisted, with Agus, a Roman ally, becoming the city's general. In Plutarch, it is highlighted that there was an opposition to seeking Pyrrhus's aid. He cites the dominance of the war faction and the absence of some from the assembly for this. Dionysius of Halicarnassus recounted that the Tarentines, seeking assistance from Pyrrhus, expelled dissenting voices, including one Meton, who feigned drunkenness to caution against allowing a king to garrison the city, fearing his loss of freedom. Meton was expelled, and his expulsion led to a decree to send envoys to Pyrrhus, offering significant military support from Tarentum and other Greek cities in Italy. The prospect of substantial reinforcements rather excited Pyrrhus and his Epirot forces, as reported in Cassius Dio and Plutarch. Pyrrhus, considering himself a match for the Romans, harbored ambitions to challenge their power, especially in Sicily. However, he hesitated to engage them without a proper provocation. Both Cassius Dio and Plutarch highlight the Council of Cineus, Pyrrhus's esteemed adviser who, despite his wisdom and efforts, failed to dissuade Pyrrhus from his Italian expedition. Pyrrhus then sought support from other rulers, requesting funds from Antiochus I of the Seleucid Empire and ships from Antigonus II of Macedon. Ptolemy II of the Ptolemaic Kingdom in Egypt provided troops under the condition 
of a limited service term, and appointed Pyrrhus as guardian of his realm during his absence, in exchange for Pyrrhus taking the bulk of his army to Italy. Zenarus recounted Pyrrhus's opportunistic response to Tarentum's call for help, insisting on a clause in their treaty to avoid prolonged stays in Italy. He detained most Tarentine envoys as hostages under the pretext of needing their assistance, while dispatching a few with Cineus and troops. Pyrrhus's arrival shortly after Agus's disposition, emboldened the Tarentines, who elected one of the envoys as commander. Pyrrhus then sent Milo with additional forces, securing the Acropolis as his headquarters. Meanwhile, Lucius Aemilius retreated to Apulia to avoid Pyrrhus's reinforcing troops but was ambushed along the way by the Tarentines. Pyrrhus, unwilling to wait for spring due to the Mediterranean stormy winter, embarked for Italy, enduring a harrowing sea voyage. Never a good idea to sail at this time. Plutarch noted that many ships were lost in the storm, with Pyrrhus himself rescued by the Messapi. Only a fraction of his intended forces even managed to reach Italy at all. Pyrrhus initially refrained from imposing restrictions on the Tarentines, but later enforced military discipline and curtailed civilian liberties to prevent any defection to the Roman side. Dissenters left the city viewing Pyrrhus as a tyrant rather than an ally. Well, that's what happens when you curtail civilian liberties, right? Nobody likes that. Now, Apian had described Pyrrhus's draconian measures, including forced military training, house arrest, and brutality by his officers as just a few of the reasons that people decided to flee the city. And fair enough, he sounds like a bit of a douche. Regium, seeking Roman protection, fell victim to internal treachery led by Decius, who manipulated circumstances to seize control, allying with the Mamertines. The Romans initially overlooked this while preoccupied with Pyrrhus, but eventually dispatched Gaius Fabricius Lucinius, who recaptured Regium, executed the rebels, and punished Decius for treason. Before this period, Rome had never engaged in military conflict with any of the Hellenistic states in the Eastern Mediterranean. So yeah, achievement unlocked. Good job, guys. Publius Valerius Levinus, one of the consuls for 280 BC, led a sizable army against Pyrrhus, aiming to intimidate him by marching through Lucania and seizing strategic positions. In response to this, Pyrrhus sent a letter proposing arbitration to settle disputes with the Tarentines, Lucanians, and Samnites. But Levinus was not going to accept this. He immediately smacked down the offer, asserting Rome's independence and readiness for war. Levinus even showcased his forces to Pyrrhus's scouts, underscoring Roman's military might. When the scouts came over to have a look and they were spotted, well, he essentially said, let's show them what we've got so they can come back and tell Pyrrhus exactly what he's up against. 
because they knew that Pyrrhus would not like what he hear. Pyrrhus, yet to be reinforced by his allies, established his camp and awaited their arrival, hoping to exploit some Roman supply difficulties. When the Romans advanced, Pyrrhus positioned his troops defensively along the river Sirius, intending to engage them as they crossed. Despite initial Roman resistance, Pyrrhus's use of elephants and Thessalian cavalry caused a great deal of confusion, and the Romans actually began to retreat. After this battle of Heraclea, Pyrrhus gained significant renown and attracted numerous allies, bolstering his forces. Despite suffering significant losses, including his best troops and some of his most trusted generals, Pyrrhus advanced within 60 kilometers of Rome, plundering territories along the way. However, the Roman Senate remained resolute, rejecting offers of peace or truce proposed by Pyrrhus through the many emissaries he sent. Now, Gaius Fabricius Lucinus, leading a Roman envoy, met Pyrrhus to negotiate the release of Roman prisoners. Although Pyrrhus expressed a desire for friendship and peace, the Romans refused any terms that would compromise their sovereignty. They eventually accepted the return of prisoners without conditions and dispatched Cinius to Rome to negotiate further. In Rome, Cinius attempted to secure a peace treaty, but the Senate, spurred by the resolute stance of Apius Claudius Caecus, rejected the offer. Apius Claudius argued that Pyrrhus could not be trusted, and that Rome should continue the war until Pyrrhus withdrew from Italy completely. Meanwhile, Pyrrhus, aware of the growing Roman strength, prepared to march directly on Rome. However, faced with the daunting prospect of confronting the reinforced Roman army, he ultimately refrained from engaging in battle and withdrew back to Tarentum. Different historical accounts vary in their portrayal of Pyrrhus's movements following the Battle of Heraclea. Some describe him marching towards Rome, laying waste to territories along the way, while others depict him diverting through Etruria and Campania, before ultimately returning to Tarentum. Amidst these events, Rome also engaged in diplomatic efforts, sending envoys to Ptolemy II of Egypt, likely seeking support or alliances to counter Pyrrhus's growing influence in Italy. The Battle of Asculum in 279 was a pivotal moment in the conflict between Pyrrhus and Rome with differing accounts from ancient historians regarding its specific outcome. According to Cassius Dio, Pyrrhus invaded Apulia in the following spring, capturing several places before encountering the Roman army near Asculum. Both sides hesitated to engage in battle for several days. Rumours were circulating that Publius Decius Mus, one of the Roman consuls, was preparing to perform a devotio, a sacrificial act where a commander sacrifices their life to ensure a victory. This rumour bolstered the Roman morale and alarmed Pyrrhus's Italic allies. 
Pyrrhus attempted to reassure them, but ordered the capture of anyone wearing the distinctive garments of the Decius family. The consuls, however, rejected the need for such a sacrifice. They were confident enough in the pure strength of the Roman army. While Dio asserts that the Romans emerged victorious in the Battle of Asculum, other historians present differing accounts. Plutarch, for instance, describes Pyrrhus as the victor in the two-day battle. However, he also highlights Pyrrhus's recognition of the heavy losses suffered by his forces and the challenges he faced in replenishing them. Pyrrhus's favorite remark, one more victory like this, and we are undone, reflects his realization that even victorious battles against Rome exacted a heavy toll on his resources and manpower. While Rome, they didn't have many problems replacing their losses. Dionysius of Halicarnassus's account does not clearly indicate the outcome of the battle either, leaving room for interpretation. Nonetheless, the broader consensus among historians is that, while Pyrrhus may have achieved tactical victories in individual battles, the cumulative attrition and resilience of the Roman forces ultimately proved decisive in the broader conflict. And yes, that's where we get the term Pyrrhic victory from. The year 279 saw Carthaginian concerns over Pyrrhus's potential involvement in Sicily, where the Carthaginians held territory in the western part of the island. Reports suggested that Greek cities in eastern and southern Sicily sought Pyrrhus's assistance against Carthaginian interests. In response, Margo, a Carthaginian commander, arrived at the port of Rome with 120 ships, offering aid to the Roman Senate. However, the Senate declined this assistance, preferring to handle the situation independently. Now, despite their initial offer of aid, the Carthaginians were apprehensive about Pyrrhus's potential to disrupt their interests. Margo subsequently met with Pyrrhus under the guise of a peacemaker, aiming to discern the king's intentions regarding Sicily. Polybius uncovered a series of treaties between Rome and Carthage, including one specifically addressing the threat posed by Pyrrhus. This treaty stipulated mutual assistance in the event of an attack, with Carthage providing naval support for transportation and hostilities. However, despite this agreement, there was limited collaboration between Rome and Carthage against Pyrrhus. Who knows? Perhaps if they had cooperated a little more, they may have become friends and that disaster of the final stages of the Punic Wars would have been quite a lot less salty. Well, in one instance, Carthaginian forces did attempt to assist Rome by besieging a rebel Roman garrison at Regium, which had seized control of the city. However, they didn't get very far. Their efforts were ultimately unsuccessful, and they abandoned the siege after setting fire to some timber used for shipbuilding. Okay then. Despite this setback, Carthaginian forces remained vigilant, monitoring the Strait of Messina for any attempt by Pyrrhus to cross into Sicily. Ultimately, while there were efforts to coordinate against Pyrrhus, 
the collaboration between Rome and Carthage was limited. With each primary power focused on its own interests in the region, Sicily would indeed become a flashpoint for them later on. Pyrrhus's decisions to intervene in Sicily stemmed from two key factors. Requests for assistance from Greek cities in Sicily and his own strategic ambitions. Plutarch recounts that Pyrrhus was approached by representatives from Sicilian Greek cities, including Agrigentum, Syracuse, and Leontini, who implored him to aid them in expelling the Carthaginians and liberating the island from their dominance. Additionally, Macedonians sought Pyrrhus's support in ascending to the throne following the demise of their king, Ptolemy Geranos, in the Gallic invasion of Greece. Pyrrhus, perceiving Sicily as offering greater opportunities for glory and conquest, prioritized this endeavor over the Macedonian throne, which seemed more distant in Africa. We get some further context about this from Apian, suggesting that Pyrrhus's interest in Sicily intensified after the death of Agathales, the former tyrant of Syracuse, and his subsequent marriage to Agathocles' daughter, Lenassa. Despite historical inaccuracies regarding the timing of these events, Apian proposes that Pyrrhus's familial ties and potential hereditary claims to Sicilian rule prompted the inhabitants of Syracuse to seek assistance against Carthage. Upon deciding to embark on his Sicilian campaign, Pyrrhus faced obstacles posed by the Mamertine mercenaries, who had allied with the Carthaginians and sought to prevent his crossing of the Strait of Messina. Despite this opposition, Pyrrhus secured support from Tyndarion, the tyrant of Tauromania, who facilitated his landings at Catana, strategically positioning him to advance towards Syracuse. As Pyrrhus set sail from Tarentum with his forces, including 8,000 cavalry and a couple of elephants, not bad, the besieged Syracusians pinned their hopes on him, viewing him as their potential saviour due to his marriage to Lenassa. Pyrrhus's arrival in Sicily marked a significant turning point in the conflict, with the stage set for a decisive confrontation with the Carthaginians and their allies. Pyrrhus's consolidation of power in Sicily was marked by strategic alliances, military conquests and diplomatic negotiations. Upon his arrival, he swiftly garnered support from influential figures like Sosistratus and Thonon, who controlled Syracuse and its garrison respectively. Their cooperation facilitated Pyrrhus's assumption of control over the city and its military assets, including a formidable fleet of 140 ships. Additionally, Pyrrhus received reinforcements and resources from other Sicilian cities, like Leontini, Enna, and Agrigentum. Further bolstering his forces, and expanding his territorial influence. With a formidable army of 30,000 infantry and 1,500 cavalry, Pyrrhus embarked on a campaign to challenge Carthaginian dominance over Sicily. His military prowess was evident as he swiftly seized control of strategic locations, such as Heraclea Minoa, Selenus, Segesta, and many more, 
securing the allegiance of numerous cities in the region. His conquest culminated in the successful storming of Eryx and Panormus, leaving only Lilibaeum under Carthaginian control. However, the siege of Lilibaeum proved to be a formidable challenge for Pyrrhus. Despite initial negotiations initiated by the Carthaginians, who were at this point, no doubt, feeling a little bit nervous, Pyrrhus remained resolute in his ambition to expel them entirely from Sicily, rejecting offers of financial incentives and conceding only under pressure from his allies and Sicilian delegates. The protracted siege saw Pyrrhus facing significant resistance from the Carthaginians, who leveraged their superior numbers and defensive advantages to thwart his advances. His unwanted advances. <laughs> Ultimately, Pyrrhus's decision to abandon the siege and focus on naval dominance signaled a shift in his strategy securing control over the sea lanes and preparing for an eventual campaign in Africa. And despite the setbacks at Lilibaeum, Pyrrhus remained determined to fulfill his ambitions of conquest. He then set his sights on Carthage and the broader region of Libya. Pyrrhus's descent into tyranny and despotic behavior ultimately led to widespread resentment and rebellion among the Sicilian Greeks. Plutarch highlights how Pyrrhus's actions, including arbitrary executions, confiscation of estates, and favoritism towards his military campaigns, well, companions rather, eroded his popularity and credibility as a leader. Yeah, doing these things is certainly not going to make anyone popular. Try not to confiscate anybody's estates in your own circle of friends. Suspicion and paranoia further fueled his authoritarian rule, leading to the execution of prominent figures like Thoenon and the attempted arrests of others such as Sosostratus. As discontent grew, some Sicilian cities began to align with external powers like the Carthaginians and the Mamertine mercenaries, seeking assistance against Pyrrhus's oppressive regime. The deterioration of Pyrrhus's control became evident as internal unrest escalated, prompting the intervention of the Carthaginians who saw all of this as an opportunity to reclaim lost territories. In the face of mounting challenges and diminishing support, Pyrrhus received a plea for aid from the Samnites and Tarentines, offering him a pretext to depart Sicily without appearing weak or defeated. But everybody knew what was really going on, I'm sure. Plutarch's account suggests that Pyrrhus seized upon this opportunity to extricate himself from the increasingly untenable situation in Sicily. And behind him, well, he left a chaotic and unstable landscape. Now, after Pyrrhus's flight from Sicily, he ended up in southern Italy, which brings us to the final battle of the Pyrrhic War, the Battle of Beneventum. And it did not go very well for anybody, to be honest. The accounts of Plutarch, Dionysius of Halicarnassus and Cassius Dio provide varying perspectives on the Battle of Beneventum and its 
outcome. Plutarch's detailed narrative describes Pyrrhus's tactical maneuvers and the unfolding of the battle. Pyrrhus, despite facing challenges with his troops losing their way and arriving late to the battlefield, managed to gain ground against Manius Curius's forces. However, the tide turned when the Romans successfully repelled an elephant charge, leading to the disarray of Pyrrhus's ranks and an eventual victory for the Romans. Dionysius of Halicarnassus offers a more concise account, focusing primarily on the confusion caused by the wounded elephants and its impact on the Greek forces. This version emphasizes the role of the elephants in the battle and how their disturbance and confusion contributed to the Greek defeat. Of course, the elephants just went crazy, started trampling over anyone they could find, and most of that was, well, it was Pyrrhus's guys. Not a good way to go. Cassius Dio's narrative aligns closely with Plutarch's, but emphasizes the chaos caused by the wounded elephant calf and its effect on the entire elephant contingent. The narrative underscores the pivotal moment when the Romans seize the opportunity to capitalize on the elephant's disarray and ultimately secured victory. That being said, I think around 9,000 Romans died in that battle. Not good. Not good at all. While each account provides unique insights into the Battle of Beneventum, they collectively highlight the decisive role played by the Roman forces in exploiting vulnerabilities within the Pyrrhus' Pyrrhus's army, ultimately leading to his defeat. In fact, one may say that it wasn't the Romans that defeated Pyrrhus, but his own elephants. Hmm, perhaps next time he'll think twice before bringing them. Well, for him, there was no next time. The post-Pyrrhic War era marked a significant turning point for Rome, as it solidified its dominance in southern Italy and expanded its influence across the Mediterranean. Here's a couple of key developments that followed the war. Rome's hegemony in southern Italy. With the capture of Tarentum and other strategic victories, Rome asserted its hegemony in the southern part of Italy, right down there on the end of the boot, consolidating control over various regions previously influenced by Pyrrhus and his allies. And of course, a lot of people there were happy to have the Romans, because anything was better than Pyrrhus. Conquest and Colonization Rome expanded its territory through conquest and the establishment of colonies. Cities like Brundisium and Regium were captured, and colonies were founded in strategic locations to solidify Roman control and, of course, facilitate further expansion. Defeat of Rebellions Rome faced rebellions from various factions, including the Samnites, Lucanians, Brutians, and Picentes. These rebellions were swiftly suppressed, and Roman colonies were established in the conquered territories, to maintain control and, of course, prevent future uprisings. Diplomatic Relations with Ptolemaic Egypt Ptolemy II of Egypt, recognizing Rome's growing power, sought to make diplomatic relations with the rising Mediterranean force. Diplomatic exchanges and the changing of gifts between Rome and Egypt, signaled the beginning of a new era 
of diplomatic engagement between Rome and the Hellenistic kingdoms of the East. Overall, the aftermath of the Pyrrhic War marked the ascendancy of Rome as a dominant force in the Mediterranean region and set the stage for its further expansion and influence for centuries to come. But what did you learn? Well, I thought that it was quite humorous to think that the original attack on the ships was made while all of the uh, men were drunk and partying, having a good time. Also the notion that the Roman ships, all ten of them, were simply just sightseeing around the coast. Well, come on, who believes that? Whichever way it was, it's just another war, another great conflict confined to the pages of antiquity. Thank you very much for joining me. We've had a great time talking about the Pyrrhic War, haven't we? If you've liked what you hear, then you better like and subscribe and leave a comment down below. If you'd like to support the channel, please follow the link to my Patreon, where all the videos are ad free. Until then, take care of yourself, and I'll see you next time. Good night, everyone.